So welcome, good morning. My name is Kay Aubrey Shemaine and I am the Director of Photonic Therapy Institute, your host for this Independence from Pain Summit. I'm delighted to introduce our first guest for the summit is Dr. Michael Hamlin. Dr. Hamlin was a principal investigator at the Wellman Center for Photomedicine at Massachusetts General Hospital an associate professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School, and is affiliated faculty at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. He gained his PhD in organic chemistry from Trent University in England. His research interests include photodynamic therapy, photobiomodulation, drug delivery, nanomedicine, and tissue engineering. Dr. Hamlin has published over 500 peer review articles, over 150 conference proceedings, book chapters, and international abstracts, and he holds 10 patents. In addition to that overwhelming amount of work, he's taking time out of his writing and speaking schedule to sit down with me and answer questions proposed by our members and the photobiomodulation community on Facebook. Welcome, Dr. Hamlin. Okay, I just let everybody know this is the second time I've done this. I spent a whole hour a couple of weeks ago and then it disappeared <laughs> into the internet somehow. So it's all being uh, regurgitated again. I can't even remember what I said the first time. Well, that's time. good. We have, we have the same questions. We have new questions. We have people that have added to it. So, and hopefully I've been better at questions this time. And... I wanted to start, I asked you this question last time and I was fascinated by the answer. When and where did the term photobiomodulation originate? Okay, so this whole business, which today we know as photobiomodulation, started over 50 years ago in 1967 when Andre Mester in Hungary um, was had one of the first lasers because uh, Ted Maiman had only invented the laser a few years before and Andre Mester got hold of a ruby laser and he started shining it on rats and with two questions one possibly laser radiation could cure skin cancer and secondly perhaps you could cure cancer with a laser because um, Workers in Boston a year or two before had actually shown you could cure a, a cancer in a rat by shining a laser on it. Turns out that Andre Mester's laser was very low power compared to the Boston laser, so he couldn't cure cancer. And not surprisingly, he didn't cure cancer. But what he, uh, he found was that the uh, hair regrew because he shaved the rats and the hair regrew. He also implanted cancer cells in an incision and the wounds healed better. So it was a, a serendipitous discovery, mainly based on the fact he didn't have a power meter, so he didn't accurately know what the power of his laser was. But these observations were sufficiently interesting that he spent the next 20 years of his life studying it. And in those days, both Mester and virtually everybody else thought there was something magic about lasers. They thought lasers had some uh, unexplainable quality that allowed them to uh, have biological effects. Um, over the years, it became obvious that you didn't need a laser, that the same wavelength light from LEDs or even from a filtered lamp um, had similar biological effects. So what was previously called low-level laser therapy was no longer appropriate because you don't need a laser. And also, nobody knew what low-level meant, other than that, you know, it wasn't a surgical laser that could cut or burn. But still, low-level is a subjective term. It doesn't actually mean anything. And then the third issue was that although Mester had stimulated hair growth and wound healing, you can also inhibit a lot of biological processes. So you can inhibit inflammation, you can inhibit pain, you can inhibit other things. So instead of low level laser therapy, we got rid of the low level, we got rid of the laser and we introduced modulation to show it can go both ways. Hence, we arrived at the term photobiomodulation. And, and how long ago was that? Ah, 
probably about five years ago. It's not, it's pretty recent, yeah. Pretty I think. recent, yeah, and a lot of people still use LLLT, although I'm editor for a bucket load of journals, I always told them not to, but you know, you just have to keep banging away at people. Well, I got started in, in 1995, and I was told LLLT meant low-level light therapy. So, you know, I just just assumed that was it was always light instead of laser, and that it felt wrong when it was laser. There's still a few people who insist lasers are magic, mainly the Russians, actually. Sergei Moskvin is obsessed with lasers. And, yeah, I have to say, folks like uh, Lars Hode and, and some of the... Scandinavian folks are still very keen on lasers, but you know, by and large, most people accept you don't need a laser. Hmm. Okay. Well, that that takes us into the next most common question that you know the argument that's always going on is laser versus LED, and I I know there are a few cases when it looks like laser is better when you need to finally finally target, but if you'd weigh in on that on that weighty question on laser versus LED. When is a laser better? If well, I mean, the, the, the whole thing about a laser is it's easy to focus into a small spot. In fact, the light that comes out the laser is usually a collimated beam. And if necessary, you can focus it into as small a spot as you like if you have the right lenses. So obviously, the smaller the spot, the higher the power density, because you've got the same amount of power compressed into a small space. So you can have, in principle, very high power densities, even with a, a low-powered laser. Although, personally, I think it's misleading. I've seen people who've claimed to get one watt per square centimeter from a 10 milliwatt laser, which I think is ridiculous, but never mind. <laughs> so, and the other thing, as soon as the light hits the tissue, it starts to scatter. So even if you have a very high power density, once you've gone in a millimeter or two, it, the, the light is scattered and diffused, so the power density goes down. But you know, having said that, if you do want to get light into deep tissue, it does help to have a focused laser beam. It does penetrate a bit better. And the collimated light is more likely to be forward scattered than LED light, which comes from all directions. And once it, so um, as you were saying before, we've learned more and more about the body seems to re respond the same. Now there's what seems to be to be a marketing term, but I'm not sure, and that's the term super pulsed lasers. Is there anything magical about super pulsing? Oh, so the 904 semiconductor laser comes out as what they call super pulse, which is, you know, nanosecond pulse duration. Um, as far as the uh, cells go, it may just as well be CW. There's, and, you know, some of these companies persist in talking about the peak power as the average power. So they say, ah, I've got a 20 watt laser, well that's the peak power of the nanoseconds. In reality, it's a 100 milliwatt laser, is the hmm. average power. So that, that, that is deliberately misleading, in my opinion. And does it change the depth of penetration, in your opinion? A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, but you get, I mean, you know, the whole point about pulsing, right, is that you get photons deeper, but there are fewer of them. That's the key thing. So there are some detectable photons deeper with a short pulse laser, but there's not many of them because you've split it. You've split the total power output into a lot of little packets. That's fascinating. Okay, that's the best description I've heard of that. So that's laser versus LED. Let's shift a little bit into wavelength or color. Um, near we 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 traditionally think of red, infrared, maybe some blue for photobiomodulation. There's a lot going to being talked about now on near infrared versus far infrared. Can you, can you, and, and I saw an article yesterday that keeps referring to deep red. Can you define those for us a little bit? Well, I mean, you know, the, <clears throat> the 
international um, energy wave authority has defined the wavelengths of light. So red goes up to 750 nanometers, and then it switches to near infrared. Near infrared goes from 750 to, I think, 1200, 1150, 1200. Mid infrared goes from 1200 or whatever it is up to 25 microns and far infrared is 25 to 100 microns. Now, a lot of people mistakenly call lower wavelengths in the mid infrared as far infrared. So, you know, the people that have <coughs> far infrared saunas, which are um, 9.3 microns, 37 degree emission, black body, insist on calling it far infrared, but you know, it's not really correct. It's mid infrared. And that's a uh, thermal reaction, not a biochemical reaction. Well, quite a lot of photobiomodulation is actually a thermal reaction, as you call it. Okay. So at some point in the 800s, who knows where, but 850, let's say 850, at some point, the absorption of the photons is primarily by water which is the main chromophore, because the other biological chromophores sort of stop absorbing in the 800 region somewhat. Okay. And there's so much more water that it just dominates. But having said that, you're not heating up the tissue. You're, you do not have enough power to heat up the tissue. Because the tissue is constantly cooling itself, right? You've got blood flow, air, all sorts of, the, you know, unless your power density is ridiculous, and what is ridiculous? Well, yeah, in the near infrared, you're talking 500 milliwatts per square centimeter. In the red, it's more like 300. But there you will produce noticeable heating of tissue. But below that, the tissue manages to cool itself. And I think what the question you're asking is what is the chromophore? And it's quite clear that from near infrared upwards, the chromophore is probably water, is water, more often than not. And how, how is that important? There's this nanostructured water inside cells. And whenever you have a hydrophilic, hydrophobic interface, such as plasma membrane, mitochondria, various things in cells, the water absorbs the energy. But it doesn't get hot, at least not measurably hot, but it does vibrate more. And the vibration of these nanostructured water causes changes in proteins. And one major change is that ion channels open, but other proteins change. And you know, some people think that uh, ATP synthase, which is a molecular rotor, revolves better because the nanostructured water is vibrating. So there, there's several ways of putting energy into water can produce biological effects. And it's the same biological effects you would get with an infrared sauna. That, now you've sent me down a whole other rabbit hole that I have to start reading on, because I hadn't really read about the, the, na the nanostructured water. So that's got my, that's got my brain over here, and I'm going to go do some more research. Well, um, you know, I mean, a, a 50 probably is absorbed to some degree by chromophores, but 904 or 980 or 1064 is clearly absorbed by water. By water, okay. So this takes us into the whole, uh, the dosing arguments. So, you know, and, and much of the research that's out there can be very confusing because every, everybody has their own amount of, of uh, joules of light that they've delivered in different ways over different surface areas. The question I get asked most it, it, on dosing is how much? How much light do we want to deliver in a session to pr produce healing of tissue, whether that be the brain or a broken leg? Okay, so there's two ways of measuring dose. The traditional way of measuring dose is in joules per square centimeter. And the reason this is traditional is as I just said, this whole thing started with laser therapy. So if you have a focused laser beam, let us say it's one square centimeter area, then you measure the joules per square centimeter. 
And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But if you have an LED array, which has a large area on the body, which could be easily be 100 square centimeters, because that's only 10 by 10, it could easily be 1,000 square centimeters. Sure. Then the most appropriate way to measure the dose is the total number of joules. So, for instance, if you have a, what most people would think is a very low power density, let us say it's 10 milliwatts per square centimeter, okay? And you have 1,000 square centimeter spot, which is 30 by 30 centimeters, so it's not that big, right. sort of an array. Then every second you are putting in 10 watts. That's a lot of light over, over, this, over the entire area, right? Yeah. So, you know, the joules add up quickly in that case. You're putting in 10 watts a second, which is 600 watts a minute. So in 10 minutes, you're putting in six, sorry, not watts, joules. In 10 minutes, you're putting in 6,000 joules of energy. And at what point is it too much? And is, it a, is that a factor of time? Too much in a, in a minute versus too much in an hour? Well, the limit is power density, because if, as I said before, if, you, if your power density is 300 milliwatts per square centimeter, you will heat up the tissue and it will be painful. But, you know, if you've got an LED array, which is only 10 or 20 milliwatts per square centimeter, there's probably no rational limit. So, you know, if you go in a whole body light bed and you're in there for 10 minutes, you will absorb 200,000 joules of optical energy. And just as a comparison, if you go sunbathing, you put your sunscreen on and you go sunbathing for an hour, you can absorb a million joules of optical energy. That's a great, so, that's a great analogy. Because it's spread over the whole body. That's the key thing. So I think you need, using LEDs, you need a few thousand joules to do any good. Maybe two or three thousand seems a sort of appropriate sort of amount. That's that's a good. I mean, that's always the question that comes up, and of course, very few of the devices just generally on the market for home use actually give. If they give output at all, they it's, it's highly inaccurate. Many of it's been measured with solar me, solar uh, power meters and so on. So. How do we, you know, how do we start standardizing tests and, and so that our the research has reliable information and, and you know how do we what's the best way to know how much light you're getting? Well, you need a power meter basically. You need a, a thermopile based power meter. I'm sure you can get one with with a photo detector that works fine. But you're right. So solar sort of light meters don't really work. You need something that's built, you know, the, if you're looking on the internet, look, search for a laser power meter and you'll find laser. something that works. Um, is, there, is, there any, is there any oversight group that, that um, you know, that, that gives information and, and looks at the different manufacturers and says, this one is giving reliable information and this one is not, or is that not, it doesn't exist yet? Yeah, and I think the folks at Walt talked about doing that, whether, you know, I'm not really <coughs> have any position at Walt, okay. you know, at the Walt meeting in Nice, and this was definitely one of the things that was discussed, whether there should be some committee to check claims and, and you know, make sure everybody specified their parameters. That's what irritates people is that a lot of websites do not specify the parameters. Exactly, exactly. And it's ridiculous if companies are trying to keep it a secret, you know, because anybody can measure them. They can measure the wavelength, they can measure the power, measure the power density if they have the right equipment. So the company should just say what it is. Right. And, and, and that way you know how to get the best results from any piece of equipment so you're more likely to be happy with it because you got better results because you knew how much you were giving. Right. And, you know, 
to some degree, it's irresponsible to be treating real human patients without knowing exactly what you're giving them. I agree. Yeah. So let's go back to color a little bit. One of the questions that came in, um, of course, there's a lot of discussion right now on using UV light or blue light as an antimicrobial in the face of COVID, in the face of everything else that's going on. At what point does ultraviolet switching into blue become safe? I know there's a lot out there about ultraviolet can be very, very damaging. Well, you know, this is something that's got a lot of popular traction that ultraviolet is damaging. It didn't. Okay. So, you know, it's definitely a scientific fact that chronic exposure to ultraviolet B, which is, the, you know, in the sunlight, will give you skin cancer. But you've got to expose yourself over months or years. Okay. Typically, UV-induced skin cancer is people who work outdoors, farmers and sailors and people that spend a lot of time outdoors for decades. If you have acute exposure to UV, you'll get a sunburn. Your skin will go red, you'll get top layer will peel off, it'll be painful for a while. But unless you have some genetic abnormality, all the DNA damage is repaired easily. So even a, an acute UV sunburn is not anything to worry about. And even then, you know, you've got to get a lot of UV acute to get a sunburn. Um, so in my opinion, UVC, UVB, which will give you a sunburn, is relatively safe anyway. Because if you want to use it to kill bacteria or viruses or something, the, the doses needed are a fraction of what's needed to harm um, the skin in an acute situation. Wonderful. Now, some people, I mean, there was one company that designed a UV hand washing station. So at UVC and you put your hands in and you sort of rotate them under the UV lights to kill all the bacteria and viruses on your hands. You know, and I did a sort of calculation that there was any chance that this could be harmful. And basically you would have had to use it once a day for years, the standard statistical chance of getting skin cancer on your hands. Well, that's good to know. I mean, because the question came in specifically about 405 nanometer, which is, you know, right on that blue violet. Uh, yeah. so four, 405 is, will kill bacteria. There's been one or two reports it can kill viruses, but I don't think it's very good at killing viruses. It's not very good at killing bacteria, but it will do it. You need a lot of it. Uh, my lab did studies with infected wounds and mice and four or five nanometer light, and we found we needed hundreds of joules per square centimeter to really, you know, kill logs of a bacteria in a wound, even a superficial wound. Um, is, there, so people, is there a wavelength that works better for that? Or uh, range the, short, wavelengths? the shorter the wavelength, the better, but the, penetra the penetration is not good. So it has to be very superficial. Okay. I mean, UVC is the best for sure. 270 nanometers is the most bactericidal and virucidal wavelengths. You know, and people, especially now this COVID thing, a lot of people have started to dig out various kinds of UV lamps for sterilizing things. And, there's even one company wanted to have a device that you sort of put on your head and it had a curtain of UVC light that came down in front of your face to try and stop you breathing in viral particles. Wow. That's <laughs> I hadn't that's what I've missed. I'll have to go I'll have to go take a look at that. Well, sticking with this color question and, and the different safeties and so on. The next question we see come up all the time is, do you need to wear goggles for panels, for pads, for, you know, when, when are goggles necessary? Well, whenever you have a focused laser beam, you should, probably should wear goggles. Because, you, you know, there have been cases of usually folks on laboratories that end up 
blinded by a laser beam. You can do it. I mean, laser beams have been used as military weapons to blind, you know, fighter pilots and things. So, you know, but it's a high power focused laser beam. Um, and usually it's in the infrared, it's invisible. Because if it's visible, you don't, you're not going to shine it in anybody's eye because they're going to see it. <laughs> yeah, they're going to close. So, so but with that, LEDs, no. I mean, it's, it's impossible to damage anybody's eyes with LEDs. I mean, so the worst panels, the panel manufacturers selling red and infrared LEDs and sending out goggles, that's just kind of a... Yeah, more... right, absolutely. That. Probably they think it makes the things look a bit more high-tech if you give you goggles, but it's actually good for your eyes. So, you know, both red and near-infrared light actually good for your eyes so if you like me your eyesight's not what it was when i was younger you know i use near infrared light in my eyes maybe it helps who knows but you know for, for things like age-related macular degeneration it's going to be a licensed treatment because uh, lumithera has their device approved in europe and this is an office-based device to shine three different wavelengths of light into your eyes for dry AMD. I know the only, the only treatment there is, so I guess we'll make some money at it. <laughs> well, I think 10, 10 people sent me a, a new article that came out yesterday that was uh, deep red, uh, but they were, they were low output uh, torches, flash night, that people stared straight into their eyes and they saw benefits. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, I needed someone like you to give that answer, to give more gravitas to that answer that people are a little over worried about their, their panels, especially damaging their eyes. Um, shifting the discussion about color the other direction, not the color of the light that we're shining, but the color of the skin with people have, uh, the question keeps coming up, does someone with darker skin need a much higher dose because the skin would be absorbing more of the light at the shallow level? Yeah, I mean, that's true. So if, 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 if you have a focused laser beam and you shine it on, you know, people with different Fitzpatrick skin types, the people with skin type six, you know, the really black skin is going to get hot a lot sooner than people with white skin, for sure, because the laser is absorbed and it generates heat in the skin with the melanin. So logically, since the melanin clearly absorbs the light, you probably need more light to get deeper into the body. But nobody's really studied it. There haven't been any, yeah, okay. Not really. I mean. So if you're using a panel or you're using a pad and if you have very dark skin, I would use error on the side yeah. of giving yourself more, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so shifting biology a little, let's talk about different parts of the body. Um, one, I got a good question. Like, have different cell types, mesoderm, endoderm, etc., been shown to respond differently to photobiomodulation? Yeah, so since the main photoacceptor, even having said about water and ion channels and all this, but even so, mitochondria are still the main photoreceptor, and they have ion channels as well. So it's the mitochondria in the cell that really absorb the light. So logically, cells with more mitochondria will respond easier at lower doses, which is true. You know, people who've looked at neurons and cardiomyocytes and liver cells and kidney cells, all of which are stuffed full of mitochondria, find you need much less light for these mitochondria-rich cells. And muscle cells, of course, are full of mitochondria than for, say, skin cells. So, you know, skin cells have relatively few mitochondria. So. Hmm. Um, that's in cell culture studies in the lab. And also, you know, it explains why you put light on the head and everybody who calculates light transmission into the brain comes up with a very low figure, you know, less than 1% usually. But still, your cortical neurons are stuffed full of mitochondria and they're going to respond to very low doses of light. 
yeah, and your book on my on photobiomodulation for the brain shows such a wide variety of ways that it's been researched and how much has been given and how much has been absorbed. Um, and I'm, I'm correct, the brain cells have a high level of mitochondria. Yeah, the highest in the body, yeah. The highest in the body, okay. Oh yeah, even higher than the heart, and the heart's got a lot. You know, it's funny, I, it was only in the last few years, I've been doing light therapy for 25 years, it's only been in the last few years that I even realized that cells had more than one mitochondria. You know, my, my basic biology classes in college and high school never mentioned multiple mitochondria. They just said, here, you have this in the cell, and you have this in the cell, and that's so fascinating. And now that we've known... That, that's an interesting point you just raised. So... Not only do your cells have hundreds and thousands of mitochondria, but they're not all the same. Right. So if you have a mitochondrial disease, the theory is that photobiomodulation can help the healthy mitochondria to proliferate and the unhealthy mitochondria may just waste away because the healthy ones are being stimulated because they've got all the right chromophores in their respiratory chains. So that's one reason why photobiomodulation can treat mitochondrial disease by helping the healthy mitochondria to preferentially proliferate. That's great. Okay. I actually have a sort of a goddaughter that, that overcame mitochondria disease. And we, nobody ever pointed out that there would be healthy ones and unhealthy ones. That's great. Um, all right, so let's move a little bit into, into the brain, more into the brain. One question that came up, quote, is, uh, I heard a lot of great things about low-level light therapy for depression, but I was reading a post from about two years ago by a gentleman called William Alford who cautioned about using low-level light therapy on the brain due to the disruption of the M1 and M2 micrologia cells. Before this, I'd only heard about how safe uh, it is. He asks your perspective. Oh, I mean, I think that one of the main reasons why photobiomodulation works in the brain is exactly what you say, that it switches the microglial phenotype from M1 to M2. And why is that important? For many brain diseases, and Alzheimer's is a principal one, you know, but traumatic brain injury, stroke, depression, is characterized by neuroinflammation. So your microglia in the brain are polarized towards M1, which means they're churning out pro-inflammatory mediators, but more importantly, they can't carry out the function of getting rid of the rubbish. So the microglia that get rid of the rubbish are M2, and they're anti-inflammatory and they phagocytose, the amyloid plaque and the aggregated synuclein and all the other protein rubbish you accumulate in your brain. So the photobiomodulation has two effects. It stops them churning out nasty inflammatory mediators and it helps the garbage disposal activity. I never understood that shift before. That's that's fabulous. So a few weeks ago, there was a, a, a virtual summit on photobiomodulation for the brain. Did you learn anything new at that summit? Or, I, I, I gave a talk, but I know I had the time to listen to any other talks. <laughs> okay, that's a fair, that's a fair answer, because I listened to about four of the talks, and then life took over, but I, I have the unlimited access. I will go back and listen to all I mean, of them. yeah, it was like this. I recorded it in advance, and mm -hmm. uh, um, Joe DiDuro assembled the whole thing. I think he put a lot of work into assembling all these speakers. I did. He did a great job. He did a great job. Um, still in the brain, what, what, is, what is the current status of research going on for PTSD? And um, any more studies coming out of Margaret Naser? Or... So, yeah, I mean, there's one guy wrote a chapter in the book on PTSD. I've forgotten his name now. You, you know, he wasn't a typical academic author, so it was an interesting chapter. But uh, 
a Chinese guy in Augusta has done studies in rats, several studies in rats with models of PTSD, because you can easily do it in rats. You give them electric foot shocks or you immerse them in water. And after you've done this for a while, they have all the symptoms of PTSD. You can awaken it and extinguish it and do all the things that PTSD people. And photobiomodulation works great for that. And anecdotally, it works pretty well in people, although there's not been any controlled trials in people. And I'm sure there will be, because anecdotally, it works fine. I'm sure that, especially with, with the military looking into that now, in addition to the traumatic brain injury, that, that should be an important... Uh... Right, and there, there, there's a big overlap between chronic TPI and PTSD and depression, anxiety. They all mingle together, you know. It's almost impossible to treat one of these disorders on its own. One of our speakers uh, is, she's going to be speaking exactly about that. She deals with concussion all the way through to, to, to the senior dementias. And they're, such, they're all just tied together, in her opinion. All right. Anything else you'd like to, to, to give on, on brain and photobiomodulation and where we're going with that? Well, yeah, a lot of companies are developing helmets because you know, having a helmet that you can, especially you know, rechargeable one that's battery powered so you can sort of move around with it on your head. I think this is a, a rapidly growing area. And, you know, usually in the near infrared, say 830, 850 nanometers, and you want a decent power, um, you know, so somewhere between 10 and 20 watts of optical power distributed over the whole head. Um, you know, the hair is a, is a barrier to light, so you probably want it on the forehead and even perhaps in the eyes because behind the eyes is the uh, orbitofrontal cortex and apparently that is often damaged, especially in TBI. So and some that, of the helmets not only cover the head, but they kind of cover the face as well, basically. Excellent. That's good to know. I know that there's a lot of people out there even researching doing, you know, their own home done brain buckets with the LED strips. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's... See, this it's was the Australians who, who really moved along with Parkinson's. Right. And these, these brain buckets, as you put it, seem to work quite well for Parkinson's. So, you know, but obviously the, there was no real funding. So the <laughs> patients or their families had to buy these devices and didn't have much money so that right we'll just go down to the hardware store and get led strips and wind them round inside a bucket or a lampshade or what have you and put it on your head if you're facing parkinson's and that might help why not yeah yep. okay into cancer number one question is it safe you know people get told by their doctors and i get this call every week my doctor says I can't use it because I have breast cancer or I have had cancer in the past and so he doesn't want me using any photobiomodulation. How would you respond? So photobiomodulation is probably the leading treatment for cancer therapy side effects. And these are many and various. So the, the three common ones are oral mucositis, um, peripheral neuropathy, hand and feet syndrome, and radiation dermatitis. And there's no real drug treatment for any of these. It's just supportive care. But since photobiomodulation reduces inflammation and stimulates healing and tissue regeneration, it's great for these cancer therapy side effects. So folks, again, as you say, were worried, well... You know, if there's still some lingering cancer cells somewhere near where you're putting the light, because, you know, if you've got head and neck cancer, it could be when you're treating the oral mucositis, or if you've had breast cancer and got radiation dermatitis, then, you know, the, you're going to put the light where the tumor used to be. And there might be some lingering tumor cells there. Could the light kickstart them back again? Um, and no evidence for that at all, but 
Um, and there is some evidence, but not very good evidence, that shining light on an actual cancer can be beneficial. But, you know, it's limited evidence and sort of a few animal models. And, um, you know, Santana Blank did a study with patients with terminal cancer and they lived a bit longer, but who knows? So there's still, yeah, and it's, again, nothing, no reason not to, and we'll, as we learn more and more and more, there may be more reasons to do it and better protocols for getting better, better benefits. Right, yeah, I mean, right. I think, you know, if the cancer therapy side effects are not where the tumor is, I think it's a no-brainer, you know, so for peripheral neuropathy or radiation dermatitis, it's not directly where the tumor or oral mucositis, I think these are no-brainers. But now, I'm not recommending that everybody who has cancer immediately goes out and gets a photobiomodulation device and signs it on the tumor, but it might work. But safety-wise, if they're, if they're using light for the, everything else in their life, don't be freaking out that you might have a little extra light, give, give light in the area of, of the cancer. No, I, I really don't think it's worth worrying about compared to the actual benefits you're likely to get. Excellent. Um, in that same, I, I, had a, I had a great question follow up for that and it went flying out of my head. So I'll switch over. Um, one of the questions that came up, people wanted to know, are there any plans to use, do you know of, to use uh, photobiomodulation in space station research or with Na you know, NASA and space station and where we're going? You asked this question last time. I yeah. did, and, and it was a great answer. So hi, Harry Whelan from uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, he got funding from NASA 30 years ago to work with what then were called NASA LEDs, because. The, you know, LEDs had just been introduced and there was a big NASA thing. And Harry Whelan got funding to look for the medical effects. And the idea was you could use these NASA LEDs for wound healing and space flight and various other um, applications that everybody who does PBM knows about. Um, so that's, I don't know whether anything's changed since then. I don't know whether... Haven't seen you know, anything specific on, on, on space station... Uh, like, oh, as I say, they did study it 30 years ago, and we know it works, so why wouldn't they use it? You know, I'm going to have to do some more looking into that. It's, it's an interesting, for me, it was an interesting premise for sci-fi books. Um, the, some of the most, some of the new applications, and some not so new, but some to me that were new, uh, photo anesthesia. Uh, that like um, uh, Roberta Chow and others are doing and yeah. look, speak to that. So what Roberta does is have a focus laser spot and the idea is that you know because we just talked about mitochondria so peripheral nerves again have mitochondria and they whiz up and down the axons on the microtubules and that's how pain signals are transmitted because the, the mitochondria act like little sort of railway trucks going up and down the rails. And if you put a lot of light on them, you will paralyze, temporarily paralyze the mitochondria and this stops the pain signal. Now, this is a fairly high power density, you know, not, not going to burn anybody, but still it's on the high side. <clears throat> what we found in an animal study was, you know, we used sort of, it was actually a laser, it doesn't matter, it was a big broad spot, it wasn't a high power density, it was a big broad spot. And we found that three to six hours later, the pain threshold was dramatically increased, so that the amount of stimulus needed to feel any pain was much higher. So it acted like it's an anesthesia. The focused spot works pretty rapidly. Within seconds or minutes, you have a deadening. It's like a, injecting a local anesthetic. It's pretty rapid. And people, you know, dentists have done dental surgery with laser anesthesia for years. You know, if kiddies don't like injections, they won't 
tolerate an injection. You can use a laser beam and get the same results. Um, you know, in, in, our, in, in the study we did, which again was rats, it wasn't humans, but we did a lot of, you know, immunohistochemistry. So we looked at the biochemical markers and found that things were going on in the tissue, which meant that the pain threshold was dramatically increased. And, and that was, again, I mean, it was near infrared, 810 nanometers, but not, you know, not ridiculously high influences, 10, 20 joules per square centimeter, that sort of area. Mm. And that, and how long did, how long did those effects last? Well, it was maximum of three hours. You could still see it at six hours, but 24 hours later, it had completely mm -hmm. gone. And the interesting thing was you could repeat it every day for a week. So there was no development of tolerance. And if you had used like a, an opiate painkiller, you can develop tolerance in animals in a few days. Right, it's very quickly. Remarkable. So another area, and I know you've been very involved in this, it's a, would you explain what photodynamic therapy is compared to photobiomodulation? The photodynamic therapy involves adding an exogenous chemical, which is quite often a deeply colored dye, you know, porphyrin, a thalocyanine, a phenothiazinium, some deeply colored chemical that absorbs the light, generally red light, and it does a chemical reaction to form reactive oxygen species, mainly singlet oxygen, but hydroxyl radicals. And these reactive oxygen species kill things. Sure. So they can kill cancer cells, you can kill any cell, but you know, you want to has to be a cell you want to kill. So you can kill cancer cells, you can kill bacterial cells or fungal cells, you can destroy viruses. You can even destroy unwanted tissue, like uh, excess scarring or some tissue you don't want. And how do you target that specific cell that you want? How do you get the dye good, to that cell? Good question. Good question. So originally, it was discovered because if you injected some of these porphyrins, they naturally accumulated in tumors by mechanisms which are interesting, but not completely understood, but, you know, sort of understood. Um, so now people have looked at other ways of doing it. You can attach the dyes to monoclonal antibodies that target cancer cells, for instance. You can use nanoparticles that accumulate in tumors. If you're trying to target bacteria, you can use, you know, various polymers and ligands that selectively bind to bacteria. All these ways of getting the dye to the target cell and tissue. And for things like infections, it makes sense to locally inject or apply the dye because you know where the infection is. So if you're using photodynamic therapy to treat infections, probably not going to be a systemic infection. It's probably going to be a localized infection, right. like a wound infection or an abscess or dental infections, infections in the eyes, somewhere where you know where it is and you can put the dye where the bugs are. So, and then I'm assuming they're doing the same thing with, with deep bone infection, getting that down into the bone? Yeah, I believe people have studied it for Osteomyelitis, yeah, where you inject the dye into the infected area and then you put an optical fiber in to get the light in. Okay. Other, so, so we have, we've got photoanesthesia, we've got photodynamic therapy. Any other emerging new ways of using light for therapy? Um, Anything that's been tried that was really disappointing? I mean, one thing that's interesting um, is what the company is called Far Infrared. But so it turns out that if you have the right kind of ceramic nanoparticles in fibers, you can make clothing and patches and dressings and bandages, which have no external power source, right? Just a piece of cloth. So if you wear this garment, or then they make bed sheets, they make bandages, the heat from the body 
will activate the nanoparticles to emit 9.3 micron infrared radiation, which is the same radiation as you get from a sauna. Now, because there's no external power source, the power density is quite low. We calculated at 0.5 milliwatts per square centimeter. But there again, if you've got a shirt or pants or a bandage, you can wear it 24 hours a day. Right. You have bed sheets, you can sleep in them all night. And this has a remarkable benefit. It helps the muscles recover, it helps people to sleep, helps our overall health and you know, maybe some systemic diseases like various kinds of heart disease, possibly diabetes, all sorts of possible things. Improving the circulation to those extremities. Yeah, yeah. all right. This is totally no external power source. You're using the body's own heat as the driving force, more or less, for photobiomodulation. That, that's... I'm continually fascinated by the ever expanding uses and applications and approaches for this. And I, I really am excited to watch where this goes. Um, education wise, we, you, you mentioned last time when we spoke that there is a degree in photobiomodulation or, or a certificate that's going to be done with a university in France. Yeah, I, a couple people have asked about this. How do you get, how do you get an advanced education in light therapy? Well, this, this is Damien Vila, who, uh, who uh, I think he started his own society or something in France. And I forget what he calls it. EMALT, that's it. E-M-A-L-T, European Medical Association for Laser Therapy, something like that. And he has got funding from uh, a university in Paris to have some kind of course I'm not sure whether you actually get a master's degree, but it's a, some kind of postgraduate course that will give you a qualification in photobiomodulation. And I suspect the COVID thing has maybe delayed its plans. I believe it was, gonna, it was meant to be launched in September this year, but it's probably been delayed. Probably delayed now. a lot of our plans, <laughs> everybody's plans, yes. So, um, yeah, Walt is now a whole year later. Yeah. So, um, and, and if I understand it was going to be, they were going to have people like yourself come in and teach a segment of that course. Now, yeah, maybe, that maybe I, I recorded it. I think I've got off all this traveling around to speak with, you know, if you can just record your talk. And yeah. you <laughs> it's, getting, lot it's getting popular, isn't it? All right. Advice, and this is me asking because I had my first uh, my first shot at writing an IRB study this year, and it was a lot harder for me than I thought it was going to be. And here you've got five hundred under your belt. Any advice for those of us learning to write research studies? Uh, you mean write an IRB or write a? Uh, peer-reviewed paper. Well, the first was the first. That's two steps. So obviously, I'm still at the first step, writing the the research study, which I've yeah. written. And now we well, I mean, quite quite, quite honestly, if you're writing an IRB, you want to get as many as you can and copy and paste because they don't <laughs> use plagiarism checkers on IRBs. And I mean, that's how most of them are. They've been handed down through the generations. I wish I'd been told that a year ago, because that's where I ended up by the end. <laughs> I was re I must have read 400 papers trying to find the exact, you know, magic words. Oh, you know, oh. people who want who need to write an IRB in photobiomodulation just email all the people they know and get them to send theirs, and then they pick the appropriate parts out and copy and paste them together. Okay, then let's take that to the second step. You've done the research study. Any advice for then turning that into the paper, the final paper? Well, if you've never written a paper, you've got a lot of learning to do. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> and it's your yeah, fault it's I'm doing this. It's your fault. At Walt, you told me to get off my butt and start writing it down. Right, because a lot of people 
have done publishable studies, but the thought of writing a peer-reviewed paper is just daunting, so they never yes. do it. Um, quite often, they send me all the sort of things and say, can you put it together on a paper, which, you know, I might have done a few years ago, and now I'm just so overwhelmed, and I just don't have the time for that. But, um, you know, young folks will probably help. I mean, there's a lot of young folks around that are desperate to get more papers under their belt. Oh, no, that's a good point. That's a really good, that's... A even if they haven't done any of the experiments or something, if you send them the data, they'll probably work many hours and, and form it into a, a manuscript to be submitted to a journal. You're giving me the same advice as I've gotten from my business coach. Learn to outsource. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> okay, well, message, message received. Um, and... The, the 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 closing question really really where do you see photobiomodulation going five years from now well that's right. i think it, you know home use led devices are gonna keep proliferating i think one thing that puts people off now is there's so many of them available and they keep email emailing me asking which device should i get and you know to some degree i think the devices are becoming more reliable now you know they have enough power they're they're gonna they're gonna give up the ghost after the, after you turn them on you know like some of the old things from china used to do <laughs> to switch them on and it needs to go poof <laughs> i think things now are fairly reliable and you have some clue about how much power they're giving out um you know so, some people want oh i must have a a specific protocol telling me exactly how many minutes and how often to use it. But you, know, no, you don't need that. I mean, <clears throat> photobiomodulation is forgiving, right? You know, even a small amount of light will probably do you some good. And you, it's almost impossible in humans to use it too much. I suppose it is possible, but it's difficult. Yeah, the best piece but, of advice I ever heard was from a salesman instead of from a, from a, a practitioner. All the practitioners went to a summit and they're like, what, how long, what pad placement, what yeah. timing? And yeah. he said, I'll give you the best piece of advice for getting good results. Turn it on. Yep. <laughs> Turn it on. Use Absolutely. it. Yeah. I think it's non-productive to worry too much about the placement and the power density and the length of time and the number of joules per square centimeter and all this stuff. I mean, well, one thing I didn't mention is that different individual humans, regardless of skin color, have different susceptibilities to light. You know, so there's a, it's like a bell curve. So the majority of people are kind of in the middle, but a few people are hypersensitive and they are the ones that will complain that they had side effects and all sorts of things because they say, ah, oh, you told me to use this LED thing and it caused all these horrible things to happen. Um, but they're in the minority. And then again, there's another small minority that basically like blocks of wood. <laughs> so you can shine light on them all day and all night and nothing will happen. So yes, yeah, so like you said, with the bell curve, the majority are going to get benefits. We, yeah, yeah our approach is usually to tell, the, to tell both of them on both ends, open up your lymph system. Yeah, then absolutely. try it. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think you're right that putting the light on distant parts of the body to whatever you're treating, you know, the, the, uh, the spine, the dorsal root ganglion, that's mm -hmm. great for pain relief. And as you say, the lymphatics, all these are important. And the hair doing, you know, we certainly were doing pain sensitivity in the, toe, in the toes of mice. We put the light on the head, got an... Uh, analgesic effect in the toes that well and of course that's where it feels it that's what yeah. records the session the, the sensation yeah. um so any other words of advice for the people who are diving into light therapy these days yeah well i mean you can't really go wrong I and mean, you know if you get a decent powered led system you know 20 watts, something like that, 
the, the 20 watt panels are like small now. You can get 100 watt panels now and you can lie on them, right? Right. So a lot of people think, oh, I've got this big panel. I have to hang it on a door and stand in front of it. I said, just stick it flat on the bed and lie on it. Put it's it down there. Enough. You're not going to damage it. And if, if the light source is in contact with the skin, a lot more light will go in. I like so that. I, I, <laughs> I just find it ridiculous hanging your panel on the back of a door and standing in front of it. <laughs> You're, yeah, that's my style of light therapy. Let's lay on it. Let's put it directly against the body. I, I, I'm not yep. going to stand 12 inches away for 16 no. minutes. It's just not going to work. No, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for spending so much time with me again and putting up with my, <laughs> my Zoom uh, failures. Uh, I look forward yeah, to seeing you. Even, even longer than we did last time. <laughs> I told you I had more questions this time. All righty. All right. And I look forward to seeing you next year at Walt. Ah, uh, well, who can tell? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's really well, I don't bad. know whether I'm going to be traveling again, quite honestly, but there you go. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you again, Michael. Bye-bye. Bye now.